Bon dia, buenos dias, good morning, and Flormenza, that's good morning in Finnish, because that's where I'm working now. And it's interesting going to the, to the north, where we have a society in Finland, very much uh, one considers an equal society, a social welfare state. But they too are challenged with uh, these ideas of how to design, how do we keep designing. They have a great Scandic Nordic tradition of design, of course, but they realize too that it's, it has to change. So the question is how. Well, I hope today I can make you all pause and reflect, and then I hope uh, through the conference we all activate each other and that we, we think about new impacts. Um, I have a big story today, and lots of detail, but the slides are available on the FAB uh, website, so don't scribble down too much, but try and listen to uh, maybe one or two of the things that I'm saying. Everything's moving so fast. I wrote this book in 2009, and there's a definition there, which I shan't read out, but the basic thing is saying that there are people designing who are trying to balance the social, environmental, economic, and one could argue political concerns. And sometimes they do it, they know they're using design, and sometimes they don't know they're using design. I have a very open view on what design is. I didn't train as a designer. I trained as a plant ecologist. And that definition now seems to be quite old, and yet it's only three years ago, though I probably wrote it in 2008. But the idea of creating a counter-narrative, counter-narrative means alternative story. This is still very potent. And I think, as uh, Viviana acknowledged, um, we can feel an alternative story growing here. So we really have to figure out what is our role in this. So I'm going to talk about some very big things. And these are the sort of questions I've been asking myself. It's nice to do a talk like this because I've had to reflect too what it all means. But these are the three key questions. What are the strategic, uh, I should use my screen, what are the strategic objectives of open design and shared creativity? Can we really encourage positive societal change through open and co-design approaches? And if yes, what do we need to focus on? And so these seem important questions to me, and I hope you, you also find them important. Um, I'm going to give you some stuff which you're probably aware of, but um, this idea of wicked problems um, was, was created by Horst Riddle and others in the 1960s. It's an idea that the problem is very complex. It has many actors and stakeholders and players, and nobody really knows what's going on. Um, we have many of those today, but we have them now in a new geological era called the Anthropocene. And if I could just point the pointer, this is a critical date, 1876, that's when we started producing oil. And we have an oil economy today. Everything in our world depends on oil. But it was just here. This is the Holocene after the ice melted. And that's just that thin line up here. And then we have geological history going back here. And this guy, Paul Crutzen, decided that we're no longer living in the Holocene after the Ice Age. We're living in the Anthropocene. And of course, anthro is a good Latin word for man. So here we have a new geological era. And this is the kind of thing that we're doing to our world because we move massive amounts of materials. Uh, my grandfather probably just needed two or three tons of materials to live his life. I need 20 tons if I'm an average citizen in the West. So we've had a, a factor of 10 increase in our material usage as human beings. And we have these kind of plastic suits floating around the sea. Actually, there's a commercial model there that says go harvest the plastic because plastic's high intensive energy. Um, and we've got this phenomenon called peak oil. And for those that still don't believe it, go and look at the work of, I'm trying to remember the gentleman now, he's a geologist, and in 1956 he predicted America's peak oil in 1970. And he was poo pooed and people said this is crazy. He was absolutely right, of course. And if you think about the fact that America's peak oil peaked in the 70s, it might explain some of their foreign policy, since they're an oil hungry nation. So we might actually not have this stuff in the future or well, certainly not in these incarnations. Parts for these things, there are hundreds of parts and they're all moving around the, the world and they're moving around the world based on oil. So if we don't have oil, we might not be able to move the parts. And of course we've got a hot world. It's a warming world, but it, it doesn't warm equally. And this is the thing that people don't quite understand. It's not warming equally. So if we go up towards Finland, where I'm located now, which is somewhere up here, actually it gets really hot. And that was substantively changed life in Finland. But even here in Spain, where it's just a couple of degrees, maybe at the end of the century, who knows? What we do know is that all the predictions are already old. 
and we're moving beyond those early predictions. So let's use the precautionary principle, something invented in the Rio conference 20 years ago. And of course, warmer climate means that we also have a water problem. And I keep on advising young designers, go and become experts on water, because you'll always have a job. Look at it. You'll have a job in half of the world, and a growing job too. So that's where the water's running out. And of course, Spain, let's go back one. You'll see that Spain's got some real water problems indicated down here, things that I'm sure you're very well aware of. And then we look at something like, uh, this is the, the, the fourth wiki problem I've got here, biodiversity. The Mediterranean's been the cradle of life for many, many years, but we suddenly see that actually the whole of the Mediterranean region is threatened in its biodiversity. And you're probably wondering why am I talking about this with open design? Well, if open design is going to do something, it has to actually address all these issues. And of course, we have another wicked problem, financial chaos. And um, you'll see that it's all picking up again, business as usual. You see that South America here is zooming ahead. Maybe it becomes the new China, India, who knows? But these are only predictions. But we seem fascinated with growth. And yet there are very important economists that have talked about steady state economics. Where there's zero growth, but it hovers around. And I come on to perhaps the most important slide. This is unemployment in Spain. And I was quite shocked when I went to Eurostat and I saw the figures for this. That if you're a young person in Spain, there's a one in four chance that you don't have any work. And you might have a couple of qualifications as well. And I was trying to think what it might feel like if I was like that. And so I'm going to ask the question, what does open design do for unemployment in Spain? And you'll see it's quite serious. Uh, but there are other parts of Europe too. The Baltic states, interestingly, have got that problem too. Then uh, we have this question of, yes, let's do it for the economy. But which economy? You won't be able to read all this, but you can when you see the slides. But these are 50 adjectives used to describe the economy. And I just did a simple black hole search. What are people talking about? And let me go on to the next slide. Well, that's what they're talking about in the top 20 adjectives. So when you're doing open design, you have to ask yourself exactly which economy am I growing it for? And the ones in turquoise are what I call the more alternative economies. But you'll notice that at number four is the open economy. And maybe the statistic lies a little bit, because part of that is about keeping open borders open and preventing protectionism. But there's another part about it which is about opening and making the economy transparent. So that's interesting, I think. Now you notice number 12, we have this strange thing called the money-free economy. Okay, well, believe you me, there are money-free economies, because when you start to look at the detail, this is a list I compiled of what I saw as the alternative and emergent economies. So what can design do for the emergent economy? And some of these economies are non-monetary. Of course, you have here the black economy, grey and formal. I'm pretty sure in Spain now that that's grown since the recent economic crisis. That's the economy that nobody measures. But then we have a look at these dynamic economies, alternative, distributed, emerging, open, transition. And then, of course, we have these more familiar terms, perhaps, bioeconomy, clean tech, lithium economy. That's all about the electricity economy, because lithium's for batteries, of course. So interesting. And then these are the more sort of conventional terms, perhaps, that apply to the economy. But as designers, we, we have great responsibility. Exactly what kind of growth are we responsible for creating? So lots of detail there, but, uh, and of course, we've got this interesting one here, global, local, national, and regional distribution. So, yes, we have those wicked problems, and they look pretty enormous, but we have to just ask ourselves a question. How does open design protect biodiversity? How does open design create new jobs for young people? But I want to move on to uh, Spanish sociologist's view of the world, and it's, uh, it's over 10 years old now, the Cade Owl, this is Manuel Castells, and he talks about the space of places and the space of flows. And I think we have to think about open design, which kind of capitals do we want to grow? Uh, a wonderful phrase in his book, space is the expression of society, and of course space is populated with objects and people, but space is a dynamic thing. I like this phrase. So this very building is an expression of society. Everything I walked through this morning is an expression of society. And he talked about the space of flows, and this is important for open design because I see a lot of activity in this space. The space of flows is the networks, the nodes, the electronic means of communicating with each other. 
the electronic means of joining things together, and of course, of sending down digital blueprints and everything else. And this, this space of flows that has a political dimension, it's controlled in certain ways, but the interesting thing with the internet, I think, is it's, it's created new spaces within this bigger space. And then we have the space of places. You know, everybody lives uh, in a locale. A locale is where you ground your life. It's your house, it's your home, it's your community, it's the physicality of the world. So how is ocean design going to change the physicality of the world? And they have physical contiguity, that these spaces are bounded in some way. So my question is simple, how do we uh, negotiate this for open design? The space of places and the space of flows. And of course the space of flows is this circuit of electronic exchanges and it's, it's nodes and hubs and the spatial organization of the dominant elites. Those are Castell's words in 2000, they're not my words. But I think the dominant elites have been challenged in the space of flows. And I see open design as challenging that dominant elite in the space of flows. But I have to say radical openness for the TED conference, the tickets for $3,800, that's radical closeness, not radical openness. I really think they have to think that model through. It's a franchise model. Don't be fooled. I love some of the TED Talks, don't get me wrong, but it's not radical openness when a conference costs $3,800. So we have this model we're evolving with the doctoral students in Alto. I've been talking about capitals for a long time. Consider a capital the stock of something. And then, because it's a stock of something, you can have inputs and outputs. And I'm starting this model, I'm just going to talk you through these different kinds of capital. This is natural capital, and some natural capital is living. Of course, we're part of natural capital, we're living. And some natural capital is non-living. And if I just mentioned oil, that would be a non-living natural capital. And you can start to see how this model is built up. And there are definitions on the other side of anthropocentric capital. We have human capital. And this is just one definition, but you can go and make your own definition. But it's about the capital that I have as an individual human being. My spiritual capital, my intellectual, my cultural capital, and other ideas. So this notion of the human capital, and let's think about how open design increases my capital as a human. We gave people skills in the early industrial revolution how to work a weaving loom. What skills do we give them with open design? Interesting question. And of course there's social capital, and social capital has whole books written about it. But I think it's about the kind of cohesion and the social glue that we have with each other. I think it's how we create a greater good with each other. This is social capital in its very simplest form. And this is our human ecology. And then we have public capital. Um, is this building publicly owned? Is this building publicly owned or privately owned? I don't know, but if it's privately owned, it comes in my next. But if it's public capital, it's everything that belongs to the civic it's the infrastructure and buildings and, of course, intellectual property too and financial assets owned by the public. And then we have commercial capital, um, which we could recognize perhaps as TEDx, I don't know. Um, but commercial capital is privately held and it's for the, the interest of smaller numbers of individuals in general. It could be man-made goods or factories or whatever. So we join these together, and I say I've been challenging my students for years now, if you're designing, at least have some thought to how you might change these capitals. Are you destroying them? Are you building them? Are you protecting them? What exactly are you trying to do with these capitals? Because you materialize life, and you materialize energy flows. So think carefully before you design. So let's go on to what are the sort of issues that open design is um, looking at. And I drew heavily on this book here, which I think is a great book, Open Design Now. Uh, I think the subtitle is Why Design Can't Remain Exclusive to Design or something like that. And there are contributors to that book in the room here, which is really nice. So I was looking at these issues. Um, what are these issues? And maybe we could just turn the lights down a little bit at the front, but I think the slides are getting a bit bleached. Is that possible to turn the lights down? Thanks. Um, protecting and growing the commons. Let's start up here. New models of enterprise new ways of design and making, new ways of generating products or concepts, new ways of visualizing information, the creation of new communities, the democratization of design, production, consumption, and new resource use, efficiency, and existing artifacts. And I'm just going to show you a few examples. You maybe know some of these uh, examples, but 
let's just have a look at some. Uh, protecting and growing the commons, and this is very simple. We've got a whole debate here in this conference, so I'm not going to stay around it, but it's wonderful to think that this was actually created in 1976 by GNU license. The whole idea of copyleft was we have to thank the software developers. But of course, we've got a range of licenses here, and we've got copyright here. And the question for open design is how do we balance this, this particular idea? Um, let's look at another issue. New models of enterprise, and Kickstarter has already been mentioned, and this is just one design I pulled off here. And it's a light that is grown through salt. So it's crystals of salt, and it's grown. Very interesting idea of design. But Kickstarter has been uh, quite an interesting phenomenon. And then this organization here too, I just looked at one of their projects, Smart Textile Services. So there are new models of enterprise that sit behind all of these things. And that's what we have to think of as designers. What's the model of enterprise? What's the economy that's, that's behind this? And then we can move on to downloadable designs. And we have, uh, obviously, uh, Drug in the audience here, and there's people later on, we're in Rare Makers. Um, but we have other people. We have the design uh, contest here. And these are all downloadable designs, openware, etc. I remember doing a blueprint in 2003, which was a downloadable design, but it was very different in the sense it was just what furniture can you make from an 8x4 piece of wood? And hey, if you've only got three tools, can you still make it? But downloadable blueprints, I guess, have been around for a long time. And if you look back to Australia in the post-war years, I forget the name of the designer, but he was doing the same thing. You could download, well, you couldn't download then, you could, you could order a pattern. And through the pattern craft, I think it's called, you could make your furniture. So these ideas are, are great, and are new ways of designing and making. There's new ways of generating concepts. This is Instructables Restaurant here, and this is uh, an open idea, uh, an idea which is put at TEDx Grand Rapids. This is in the city of Grand Rapids. It kind of borrows from the sort of pop-up phenomenon. I don't know how old that is now, but things were popping up. And these spaces are important because where people get together face to face. And then we have new ways of visualizing information. This is a project which is in visualizing how your electricity is used. And we have a couple of doctoral students at Alta working on these very things too. And I think it's interesting. We need to see these invisible energies. And maybe we need to see how material is flowing through our lives. And of course, there's a good reason why maybe this should be open. And the creation of new communities. And as you can see from the slides over the pictures I've, I've shown to illustrate this with, this is about the technological aspects of open design. It's about the code and the software you need to get these digital machines working to get a laser cutter or a CNC machine or a rapid prototyper to build up your objects. It's very much tied to the whole process of code making and the machines that you need to generate. And it's great, of course, it's very really experimental. We have a talk about Fab Labs, I think, later on too. And then we have democratization of design. We've got people that maybe are designers who are making designs that you can go and download, and other people who weren't professionally trained as designers, but are also designers, and also giving you things to download. So we have a really nice creative soup here, I think, for things going on. And then we have new resource use efficiency, and I always like this example from uh, uh, the Repair Manifesto, Platform 21. You know, we've all had a jumper that's gone small. And the solution, of course, was just to cut some holes in it and make it a bit bigger. I think that's a kind of Barcelona jumper. You know, when it's raining, one jumper complete is a bit hot, but if you have holes in it, it allows you to breathe, you know, maybe let some moisture out. There's something wonderful about that, and we could all be sharing designs like that. And so I sort of had a quick look through this, and I thought, well, what's the capital? What are the capitals that open design is looking at? What, what, what really is open design doing to these capitals? And I guess the good news is it seems to be growing a lot of new human capital, new human potential. And it seems to be done in groups. So the social capital is also growing. I'm, I'm less able to see what it's doing for public capital, but I think it's doing something. And I'm less able, well, I see some seeds happening with commercial capital, and I see a little bit happening with materials. But I see almost nothing happening with the living world. Open design doesn't seem to be interacting with the living part of our natural capital. Not completely, there are one or two projects. But. So, it's interesting, isn't it? I don't know whether that's right or not, but uh, even if it's not right, we can discuss it. And then if I look back at a classic piece of frameworking, which I've used for many years, perhaps all my life, this is the sustainability tetrahedron. We try and balance our future and present work on balancing all these things, economic well-being, 
social well-being, ecological and institutional well-being. Institution of one, that's me, we're an institution today, that's another scale, a nation's another institution, so it's a scalable concept. And then I asked myself, well, what is open design doing? And actually, I, I found it difficult to make the other links and draw the relationships. I, I saw open design as being constricted into this area and doing some very good work, I would say, too, but about democracy. We had the Open Knowledge Festival in Helsinki in, in September, and we had open data, open governance, open design, too. So definitely we're challenging this democracy. And it's maybe something about trying to figure out how we share, socially share this economy as well. But if I look in classic life cycle terms, I see that open design is only really sort of dealing with, there's a bit of recycling and reuse, but it's dealing with concepting. We, we create a, a file or blueprint, new virgin materials are used. We distribute the, the open design. We have local production and local distribution. But we don't know what happens in the next phase when the user has that piece of open design, what happens next? Maybe it's, we're just too young in this conversation. We don't know what the next part of the life cycle is. But that shouldn't stop us thinking about what is the next part of the life cycle. We have to think cyclic. So it's no good if open design doesn't think about all the fantastic work that's been done about life cycle thinking with design. It should embed it somewhere. So my thoughts then turn to can open design perhaps borrow something from co-design? And we have Jan Stappers later on, and we're going to be talking, I think, about participatory design, and I'm sure co-design and other things. Co-design simply means designing together. And so should open design maybe embrace some more co-design approaches? Because I see some benefit perhaps to doing it now. Um, I can't see always, if we're making a little sort of make a bot or something, somebody's thought about the problem space, yes. Somebody's created a design brief, but what's the context? And I'm less sure when I work back to the context of open design exactly what the context is. And I think we have to be very sure what the context is we're working from. What are the boundaries on the context? But I think by consensus we can do it, and uh, my view of co-design is quite different from yours, Jan, but my view of co-design, and I spend most of my time up here actually, this is where the design brief occurs, this is upstream of the design brief, this is downstream of the design brief. So here we're co-framing the context and the problem space. And I don't see enough of that in open design. And I think that should be as transparent as the design. How did you frame your problem? How did you frame your context? Make that transparent too. And I use my own co-design loop, these two loops here, this one. This is about sharing experiences, this is about sharing problems, understanding problems. And the briefs that are generated through my co-design workshops, there's some amazing briefs, I have to say. And then this downstream bit is about the making and the co-envisioning, well, the co-envisioning, the creative concepts and what I call co-futuring as well. So I think we have to bear this diagram in mind. It's only a diagram, but we need to do a lot more work, I think, for open design up here. Understand what the context and problems are that we're really working with. But here's an example of design by consensus. I think about 3,000 people added something to the design of this car. And the interesting thing is that the partner for this was, was a, a, a national nature uh, organization in the Netherlands. And I haven't seen the production version of this yet, but who knows? And forget the aesthetics. I mean, you might be saying, my God, that's ugly. 3,000 people can really make an ugly car. <laughs> who thought that? Be honest, put your hands up if you thought, wow. But I think you're missing the principle here. It's how we're bringing the technologies together. It's how we're having a conversation whilst we're designing. This is a little uh, experiment we did on creating a new uh, alternative food supermarket. It was just a short workshop over one day. And we set ourselves a brief. And this is the concept that we came up with. The people have created it down the bottom here, along with myself. I was a facilitator, but I was also a co-designer. And this alternative for food supermarket uh, had a very different model. It said you can meet at this supermarket, uh, oh sorry, you can sow at this supermarket, you can sow your tomatoes, you can grow them, you can learn how to do this. You can meet people, you can eat, and you can greet people. So this part of the model was all about social cohesion. It's a concept, remember. And this part of the model was all about the local economy. So you could produce here, you could trade. Uh, you could buy here, you could cook here, you could invest money or time actually, and you could share. 
And then you think of a conventional supermarket, those are the only two things you can do. You can buy things there, or you can invest in it. You can't do all these other things. And so the reason I'm telling you this story is because just a few months after we ran this workshop, just to show you that you know, great minds think alike, um, up came the people's supermarket. Now, it hasn't got all of those things that the model I was talking about. But this is kind of designed by consensus. This is the founder here. And this is our prime minister here, David Cameron. And when politicians appear at sort of grassroots happenings, either it's because they believe in them or they think they need to be seen there. I'll let you make your minds up. But local people are involved in this model. It's about employing local people. It's about trying to get as much local produce. Now, is this something that Open Design wants to do? Does it want to look at the model, the enterprise model, as much as it wants to look at how it looks? Because there is some design there, for sure. Look at the packaging. Look at the whole branding here. Look at the interior design. There's plenty of design there. Um, you know, could we have an instructable supermarket? We have an instructable restaurant. Why not an instructable supermarket? Why don't we think maybe just a little bit bigger? And this is a wonderful piece of co-design here, which was um, the National uh, Renewables Laboratory in America who didn't have any money. No surprises, perhaps. The oil lobby is very powerful there. And uh, they wanted to find out these little green algae, which algae in, on American soil are the most productive for hydrogen. So these designers, future farmers, created this laboratory kit that the school children could use. And they could go out and test the water in their pond or their local river and come back and see how much hydrogen. So they used the school children like a fantastic science lab. It reminds me of when the BBC joined up computers to do climate modeling. That's a few years ago now, but they joined up all these microcomputers in your house and into a big supercomputer to model the climate. It's, you know, this is ambitious for open design. I could get really excited about this stuff. But this was actually, I think, driven more by co-design than open design. So, Consensus, I think, is very important, and I'm not one of those people that says I don't want a, a building designed by committee. I'm quite happy to have a building designed by committee if the committee really wanted it, and if the committee feel that that's what it's giving them in life. Of course, part of that committee could be a really good architect to ensure that some of the things that they're trained about get embedded into the conversation. But there's another form of design which I think is quite important for or, or mode of operating, which is quite important for open design. I would call that design by dissensus. Dissensus means dissent. It means contesting the paradigm. Consensus is largely working within the paradigm. Although, just to confuse you further, we can have consensual dissent. We can agree collectively to dissent. No surprises about that. Perhaps. But let me show you one or two examples. This is a, and I'm labeling these design by the census. The designers I hasten to add did not label these design by the census. I'm just sort of looking at some maybe ways of thinking about this. So metabolic cities, this is a, a replicatable design which young children can use to create, create frames for plants to grow on. This is Ecobox, it's, it's kind of uh, linked to the whole guerrilla gardening movement, but it was actually designed by architects. And, I put it as designed by dissensus, but I have another slide that says it's designed by consensus. Just to show that I'm not particularly bothered about my own kind of hierarchy here, uh, binary system, because the dissensus was to take over a piece of public space. But the consensus needed was to actually make it grow, and for people to come around, around it as a community. And then this is work by Santiago uh, Quiroguega, uh, Urban Recetas. Urbanas Recetas, Urban Recipes, I think it means in Spanish. And you can download his recipes. But his recipes are a little bit more physical than a makeup up recipe or a fab lab recipe. They're about physical space and appropriating it and creating this dissension in public space. And then dissension can happen too, I think, when somebody says, why do we build big houses? Um, I'm going to build a micro house, a kind of manor house. And, uh, I'm not sure whether Lynn Paula Eggertson, uh, 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 Norwegian designers, actually see this as dissensus, but I do. Because, whoops, I just go back, sorry. Because this is a tiny house. And of course, we can locate it anywhere. And I've suggested in the city of Lati, where I, I, I work in, in, in Finland too, that they have a migrant student population. 
And some of the combination they live in is, is really boring and little boxes, but why couldn't we have these boxes, these boxes, the box home, moving around the city, creating communities? And hey, why don't we just do a piece of architecture with a, with a blueprint so people can go and make this and modify it? Well, then we have to talk to the planners. And we have to persuade the planners that maybe this is a good idea. And we can start working with the planners by introducing these interesting things here. I was a bit curious as to why the photo and the people in, but uh, this is by uh, uh, Cercada by Marco Casagrande, and it's in Taipei. Uh, but Marco Casagrande was a student at Alta University, and it's a wonderful intervention. It's temporary, it's not going to be there forever, is it? Um, so, could we have open design recipes for these kind of things I call that's designer seeding? And I have to thank John Thacker for that kind of notion of. Designers seeding, not designers planning. So seeding ideas. And uh, some small scale stuff here, kind of urban acupuncture on micro sites. So little interventions here. These can all be open design. This is a wonderful one, isn't it? I can tell you, having experienced my first Finnish winter, I needed to see that little thing in the ground. Unfortunately, I didn't because this was done in 2008. But it's these little interventions. You know, why we shouldn't configure open design just to be new objects. It can be anything. And I think there's a rich chance to throw open design open to uh, a much wider range of creativity. So I'm just going to show you a few slides to keep an eye on the time. I work in the city of Lati. It's about an hour north of Helsinki. And it's a city that had a massive industrial decline. They still have a furniture industry there, but they suffered in the 1970s, 1980s. And Somehow the confidence of the town has never come back up again. But they're also left with a legacy of pollution. And so they created a clean tech industry to clean up their own lake and to clean up their own soil. And I'm working with them, uh, I guess in co-design mainly, but um, to encourage more collaborative processes. At the micro level, we're working with the planners, we work with local communities, we work with the design institute, we work with anybody who wants to work with, we work with local designers. And uh, this is the badge they have. Of course, some of you might know that Helsinki is the world design capital this year. Um, you might also know that there's an alternative world design capital in Helsinki that, that didn't think the world design capital was open enough. So look out for the alternative design capital too. I actually do work for both. I support both. Um, but Open Lanti has got the principle that the citizens should be involved in designing their city. Um, but I wonder how many citizens really know about what we're talking about over the next two, three days, open design. How many citizens really know about this? So I've run many co-design workshops there in the city. This is just one, I picked out. And this is where many people from different design communities, planning, education, and working designers, and design interest groups, are trying to map out how does Slanty look at the design city. And they did a very interesting piece of work, in, in my opinion. Um, this is all in Finnish, you'll have to excuse me, but if you want to read what one, two and three, three and four is down the bottom. Number one here is the citizens. Number two is the city service providers. Number three is the designers, educators and associations. And number four is industry and funding organisations and education establishments and, and beyond that. But it was all these designers that decided to put the citizen in the middle. And if we're talking about open design, surely open design has to consider its primary client. Its primary client is society. You know, the primary client of the Industrial Revolution and the Digital Revolution has been business. Let's be honest about it, it has. But now we should have a primary client of society. So I was delighted to see this stakeholder mapping, where the citizens were put at the centre. So whatever design is done in this city now, it has to say, how does it benefit the citizens? And we also created a, a, what I call a meta-design brief. So you remember my uh, upstream of the design brief, that triangle? We created a meta-design brief, which informs all the other design that goes on in the city. And it was about, it started here with a dot. Active, joyful co-design based on real needs. And you keep going around that. And then we said, well, we better name, we better name co-design, we better name that it's done in the environment, and 
and this is where the ideas from all the people of Lanty, not just designers, planners, civil servants, but all the people in Lanty are important, and we develop the ideas and we think about the life cycle. And we created this simple meta-design brief. So when you're creating your micro-design brief, you have to think about how it relates to this. And I was very pleased to see, too, we got in this idea of the bioregion. Local environment can involve society, of course, but can also involve the place. And of course, we know it can involve the space of flows as well. So, out of these kind of workshops, it's interesting because I asked them in Lanti what kind of social capital do you want to grow? And uh, they thought about it and then they sort of came back and they said, well, we want a social capital that co creates. We want a social capital that has projects and events. We want to grow a social capital that shares stories and tools. And we want to uh, have a social capital that ignites communities and gives them back pride and confidence and ownership. So let's say we weren't using co-design, but we're using open design. But open design has to do some of this thing with social capital. And it's very interesting, just recently, just a couple of weeks ago, um, I ran a workshop where we, I, re I didn't realize they'd been using user-centered design since 2000 in Lati, and uh, only just about here, uh, maybe I had something to do with it, but these are all co-design projects here. But hey, what if they were co-open design projects here? I mean, really open. Because I think what that means for the city of Lati is that everybody can change it. That's what I like, the openness, that everybody can contribute something that's positive. And then I asked them too, what, what kind of manufactured capital do you want to grow in Lati? And they said, well, we need a kind of place for prototyping eco-design, and we need an exhibition center, and we need startup spaces for young designers. What does a startup space for a young designer in education say, I want to be an open designer? And then we just printed their first business card. Matthew, open designer, what kind of startup space do they need? Well, let's think about this, because I think that's also an exciting opportunity for cities. And then let's think about grow how. That's what I like in open design, that people share their grow how. It's like know how, but you're growing something. Playing with English, of course, but there's something there. And this, this happened, I mean, I ran those co-design workshops in November, and by April, they'd already created this new center. That's fantastic. There's an exhibition area here, there's breakout spaces, there's seminar spaces. It, they created it. I thought, wow, that's fantastic. Um, and then I thought, okay, for this conference, what does an open design centre look like? I hope it just doesn't look like a fab lab, because you're not going to get everybody in a fab lab. It has to embrace, I have to say too, they're not getting great numbers here, but they have to sort of figure out why not. But they did, they did it. And then growing financial capital. And this is interesting in terms of open design. I think you can definitely offer something. Uh, the people in Lati said, well, we need seed capital. Little tiny bits of money to start things off. And we need a willingness to risk an experiment. That's a change of attitude. And then we'll get a different kind of return on design investment. And when I think about seed capital, then immediately I'm thinking of all the crowdfunding websites. So why couldn't a community set up its own crowdfunding website. Why can't we show them how to do that? Uh, I asked somebody this morning, I've forgotten the name of the gentleman down here, how many, how many global uh, 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 crowdfunding websites are there? He said, oh, about 40, um, maybe 10 of those are working really well. Why aren't there 40,000? And why aren't some run by communities? Imagine giving money to your own community and watching your money do something in your community. Why aren't we doing this? And growing natural capital, um, they, for a long time they realized with the industrial manufacturing that it actually destroyed their town. So they wanted to look at natural capital in a different way. They wanted to use nature's cycle, zero waste. They are actually a European clean tech center in Lati, and have got a good reputation there. They want to use more biomaterials. They want Lati to be a living, green, breathing city. And they want to encourage eco-tourism. And they were talking about tourism where people came to learn how to make. And I thought that's wonderful. You come and, come and learn how to, to use the ancient craft of, of, of wood in a place like Finland with 70% of forest cover. Fantastic. And we've got this thing called Green City here. And um, of course that's showing it in the summer. It looks remarkably different in the winter. Um, but 
They're trying all sorts of things. And I feel they could accelerate this if they only opened it up a little bit more. And I think they will. They have a project called La and D, where the citizens can put ideas up. And we're looking for who can develop those ideas. And then growing human capital in Lanthi. And this was very sweet. This is what the people are laughing with. I was just a facilitator. They said we want to grow open knowledge. And we want to share skills. And open design has got some really interesting skills to share. Um, but maybe it needs a bit of training too. And they wanted to upgrade skills. And they wanted to improve abilities. And uh, they wanted to widen horizons. And I, whoops, let me just go back. And I think that's fantastic ambition. And so here's a city placing open knowledge. And it will admit we don't know quite how to do it yet. And I think open design and co-design are part of the sort of portfolio of techniques that they're looking at. Um, but the expression of interest is definitely there. And this is a recent workshop working in the community. Um, we actually ran it in, in, a, in a pub, in a bar. We had 12 people from the community. It's a local community called Tom 1970 suburbs, the kind of infrastructures decaying a little bit, and the planners are trying to figure out what to do with this stuff. Finland built 34% of its housing in the 1970s, and now the housing is getting old. And um, I have to say, we got the community to dream, we got them to draw maps. This is a very instructive exercise when they started drawing a map of their own location. And we were doing co-design there, but I definitely want to introduce this community to open design. What can they do with open design? And I think this is the potential. When you come down to a tiny place, I can, I can honestly tell you that these guys, they didn't benefit from Nokia. Nokia went straight by them. They were left behind. And I'm sure when I say those words here in Spain, the same feeling can be had that many communities didn't really benefit from the boom. And then I ask another question of open design. How does open design work at different scales? As a former ecologist, I'm used to thinking of different scales. That's part of what ecology is, to relate scales, the relations. I think you use this word maybe on your opening speech. The relations are critical. So I see quite a lot of open design working at this sort of scale, or maybe even this sort of scale, objects. But what scale is kind of visual information spread over the internet? Maybe it's even bigger than this. So I don't know, just let's get used to thinking about how scale and open design work together. And of course we have a wonderful film here in 1977 and Charles Raines and they actually moved much more towards intangible objects later on in their career than tangible ones. They're known for the tangible ones. In fact I think there's an exhibition here in Barcelona right now and I think it's mainly tangible objects but as they move to the end of their career they do more and more intangible stuff and they said copy what we do but copy it well and add something new. And that was the interest. So again, we may be reminded. And so this is the delicate balance that we, I think we have in Marty here. Um, how do we balance this idea of designers planning or form giving, the commercial economy, hard permanent things, and what municipalities have to do? How do we balance it with designer seeding, a sort of socio economy? What does design do for the social economy? How do we make it softer, maybe more ephemeral, and how do we do more with communities? And how does that help us balance natural capital, uh, living and non-living, and human, our human ecology? I think design has got great potential to uh, work more with uh, these capitals, and name them, and say, we're doing this open design to do this. And then I come on just to say that we also have another challenge, I think, because if we want a little bit of money, even if we want the civic purse for our open design projects, we have to tell the people who are responsible for this money it can actually make a measured impact. So you remember one of my words in my talk was impact. So we've been talking maybe about how we can potentially activate people, but what about the impact? I just want to show you quickly three projects in Devon, which were to do with, in the UK where I live, to do with designing and making. And I asked a simple question, how do we measure the growth of social capital? And it's a question you can all ask yourself in your open design projects. And I'm not sure this methodology is right. As I said, social capital has got some wonderful names behind it and whole books written about it. So how can we measure it? It seems a rather complex thing. Well, maybe I found a rather simple system to do it. I don't know. But we need these indicators. And uh, we have all these contributors here. 
Pierre Bourdieu, James Coleman, Robert Hutton, different views. But I think they had a common message that social capital seems to be a good thing. And when we destroy it with the way we run our economy or our politics, that's a bad thing. And this is the definition of social capital which I had in my design activism book. And I think the interesting words here are the mutual. Mutual support, establishing new norms, contribute to communal health, cement shared interests, facilitate individual or collective action, and generate reciprocity between individuals and between individuals in the community. So there's some clear things there, I think. So I thought, how the hell do we measure this? It's complex. And I came up with maybe four areas that we can measure. And I sent a simple questionnaire out, asking questions about whether these projects increased the degree of organizational structure. That's number one. And I asked questions about all these different things here. And you don't have to worry about the detail. You can go and read the slides later. And I thought there's another area, because social capital seems to build relationships. How do we measure those relationships? And again, I asked, what's the strength of ties between individuals? That's question number one. And I asked other questions. And by the way, this is open source. You can modify the question. Come up with your own way of doing it. Um, and then I said, what kind of skills and knowledge are we building here in these, these little projects? And they're tiny projects. They're not big projects. You'll see when I show you the slide. And uh, you know, what's the exchange of explicit skills? And then could you measure tacit skills? Um, what kind of experiences uh, are you doing? And the first one was uh, the strengths of peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And what surprised me is that all of the three designers and makers who created these projects had no trouble answering the questions. I said, add other questions if you want to. They didn't. They could have done. I said, if you don't understand the question, just cross it out. But they did. They answered all the questions. And this is the first project. This is a past master student of mine, and she's a knitwear designer. And this is wool uh, from local sheep in Devon. Each one of these sheep represents a different kind of sheep, real sheep, with different kind of wool growing in Devon. She did a quick survey of all her knitwear designer friends and found that 60% you know, uh, of them were using uh, wool from elsewhere. But 40% of them were using local wool. So she created this project. Um, it's called, um, down here, it's called Give Fleece a Chance. It's a blog there. And now she's creating a wool directory. This was just for one small area of the UK. And people have understood the value of this. It's actually showing where the local resources are. Now we could map that through open design. We could map where are the local things. We want to grow the local things. If you want a local economy, grow local things. Where are they? What do they look like? This is the second project which I was involved in in my local community in Brixham, which is a fishing port. And we created an event called Hands On. We had 20 designer makers. We invited the community to come to this new youth centre, which was in an old, redundant church building, and so it was an opening event for this building. The town's 20,000 people, and we had 1,000 people there. I regard that as a good result. And they were all making things. Now, what if we did the same with open design? Because the reason these people were there, I think, is because it's tangible. It wasn't difficult. It was accessible. You didn't have to know much about computers. They're real tools. So how do we make open design attractive and accessible to the community level like this? And then this, I include making films as part of making. This is a, a film collected called Imperfect Cinema. And they use those little flip cameras, you know, the ones with the red button on. And they teach people four basic filming techniques. And I've been to some of their workshops and you get four-year-olds and 74-year-olds making films. And it's quite remarkable to see what they come up with. And so I asked these three projects, did you grow any social capital? And this is what they came up with. All those questions about structures, um, this is poor social capital, moderate, strong. So they all felt they were growing moderate to strong social capital. On the relationships, strong. They felt everything they did built strong relationships. On sharing skills and knowledge, strong. And on experiences, everybody felt it was a strong experience. Now, this might be the wrong way to measure social capital, but it's transparent at least. The questions are there. And if you want the questionnaire, I'm happy to send it to you. You can modify it. I think the Crafts Council are using a version of it now to measure the social impact on some of their projects. So we need to get serious too, we need to measure it. 
We also want to think about, instead of just products for open design, and I'm nearly there, instead of products for open design, why aren't we thinking about services too? Services are not just dematerialized. They often have energy and materials used through their life cycle. So I don't see that many uh, really good examples of how open design is working with service design. We have a project here at Alt University called 365 Wellbeing, and the web link is on there, you can go and look at it. We've been working with old people, and the problem of aging, we've been working with these uh, 1970s suburbs, we've been working to look at how to reduce smoking uh, in uh, the population, in Finland, a whole load of things. But if you want to look at the kind of services that are occupying uh, mines in Finland, then go and look at this website, and then ask yourself, how could open design bring something to this conversation? We've used a lot of co-design in these workshops. So I'm sort of coming towards the end, and uh, I think, uh, how can open design and shared creativity stimulate new hope and growth in Spain? Because when I saw those Eurostat figures for unemployment, I thought, maybe Spain is the place where this open design critical mass can really take hold. Because the circumstances are really quite challenging, aren't they? And maybe this is where we can encourage young people with a national program here in Spain of open co-design and service design training. Let's mix all three together. Why don't the young people then become their own facilitators of workshops? Why don't we give them the skills? They don't have to go to university. We can have a pop-up open design thing and say, this is where you can come on Tuesday to learn these skills. Where are the teachers? It's us. Where's the community? It's there. So why can't we think a little bit bigger here, I think? And the second thing is explore alternative economies. When you're doing open design, go and do a bit of research. Which economy are you trying to grow? Which one are you trying to protect? Which one are you trying to nourish? To give some nutrients to? And so you make your mind up. Uh, can we have open design about timesharing? Of course we can. It's already there, the timesharing communities. But what I'm saying, can we make it more open and more design? What other ingredients can we add to make it? Um, can we expand the infrastructure? We talk about, and it's an exciting conversation, distributed manufacturing. But if I'm just distributing robots through MakerBot, or I'm distributing electronic circuits through FabLab, is that really a distributed infrastructure, or do we need something more? It's interesting to see that the CNC machine uh, manufacturers are now looking at this sort of open design market as a new market. Like, a whole community could afford a CNC machine, but one person can't. That's interesting. If I was making these big CNC machines, I'd also be thinking, where are the new markets? It could be a community in Sabadal here in Barcelona. It could be a community in Sitges gets together and has their own CNC machine. Well, that's distributed manufacturing, maybe. But maybe we have other ideas around that. But we need to look at the infrastructure. And we need to focus too, here in Spain, on renewable solar energy. If we're powering our machines for open design, why are we using oil? Come on, let's get clever. And if we're maybe also becoming experts in water use efficiency, that might be a good idea too. So how does open design address the idea of water efficiency? Because that's a big challenge here in Spain too. And I can add two, and I didn't put it on the list, I ran out of space on the slide, but how is open design addressing biodiversity? How are we caring for nature through open design? And don't forget we are nature too. And maybe open design has the potential to create new models of enterprise. Uh, the entrepreneurs down here, individual practice, commercial enterprise. When the entrepreneurs work together, I call them co-preneurs, collaborative enterprises. When it's individual practice and it's more social enterprise, this word, I have to thank Professor John Wood of Goldsmiths. He created this word entrepreneur in 1990. He hadn't a clue what it meant. But he said, I'm naming the word so we can figure out what it means. Are open designers as an entrepreneur, nothing wrong with that, or an entrepreneur? For those of you who know French, prendre is to take and donneur is to give. And then if you work in a collective way, co donneur Now this is my language, maybe you don't like it create your own. But this is about collective altruism, individual altruism, individual enterprise, collaborative enterprise, and most MBAs, most MBAs, they're still down here. 
That's a generalization, but it's maybe a truism. They're still here. Because we have a massive social enterprise debate in the UK, it's been happening 15 years. Interesting, Finland, they have a very big social welfare economy, they don't have many social enterprises. So it's a new conversation there. But now let's get clever with open design, let's get the right language, let's decide what we're really doing. And in the end, it's all about this. Life's all about balance. And if you get the balance wrong, life kind of falls over. So we have to balance this individualism, the me generation, the sharing generation. Communal, communitarianism. Not communism, but communal. We have to balance biocentrism with anthropocentrism. And that's not easy. But hey, if we share our creativity around it, and we open design up, maybe it's easier. And I suggested at the end of my design activism talk, this was an open Creative Commons license, share alike license. Um, for the mood space, and it doesn't have to look like this. this I actually, there were Google SketchUp things that you could download and modify. But the idea of bringing people around a participatory, open design space to create new local economies and to glue our society back together again, well, it needs some kind of space. Moot is an old Anglo-Saxon word, which means to discuss. And the moots were held in something called the hundreds, where hundred men had a hundred pieces of land. And one of the fascinating things with these moot meetings is they would start them, and if they couldn't decide that they'd finished the discussion, they would just suspend the meeting and say, okay, let's meet in the, uh, when the moon is dying down at the end of the month. And they'd come back and they would continue the meeting. And they would do the same again and they would continue it until they got consensus. And we can learn something from this. So I think open design needs its spaces, it needs its places where people meet face to face, because in the end, we are glued to a locale. That's Manuel Castell's space of places. But we're connected up to the space of flowers. And so open design has to ask how it perhaps orientates itself to these questions. But I was just thinking if just 1% of you, and I wrote this slide before I learned that Europe's just given 100 billion euros to Spain, I think a few days ago, um, why didn't he give the 100 billion to the citizens? Well, maybe that's a question for later, but it, it, it didn't anyway. But we only need 1% of the municipality revenue. 1% would be enough to create these open design, co design mood spaces where we can create a new economy and new uh, presence. So, my suggestion here is that maybe we need to talk about this at the conference. Um, ask what our role is in this, and go out beyond this audience, which is of course self-selecting. We're all here because we're interested in open design, but how do we reach the people that don't know about it? How do we reach the people that could benefit from knowing about it? But most importantly, what are we going to do for young people in Spain, right now? Because if I was a young person, I'd be starting to get a little bit angry. And I want to do something. So what can we give them? And I think I'll leave with that closing thought. Um, thank you for the time and attention and being so vigilant so early in the morning after a Spanish success last night with a few hangovers, I'm sure. But let's get the passion of football into open design. Then we have an audience.